Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Bismillahi rahmani rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. We're reading Imam Anawi's Atibyan fi Adabi Hamalat al Quran, translated as Etiquette with the Quran. And we're in the chapter on the etiquette of recitation, which details various things that ought to be observed when someone recites the Qur'an. And we ended the last segment, and we're on page 68, by the way. We ended the last segment with Imam Anawi talking about the issue of what would be recited in addition to Al-Fatiha. And he ended up saying that Al-Fatiha has to be recited in all rakat. We know this already. And that after the first two, in the first two raka after al-Fatiha, something should be read. In the additional raka'at, it's not a sunnah to read anything else, but it's also not offensive to read anything else. So this is where we ended up. And I should have continued with what comes next because it's connected to this issue. And what this next issue is, is it's about someone who's late in prayer. Now, when people come late to prayer, there is a disagreement amongst the scholars over whether a latecomer is going to begin his prayer from the beginning of his prayer or whether what he prays with the imam is not from the beginning of his prayer. Okay, that doesn't really make a lot of sense. Okay, so let me try to fix this up. Suppose that you're praying a two rakah prayer and you come in at the final rakah. That first rakah that you pray with the imam, is that the first rakah of your prayer or is it the fourth rakah of your prayer? Now, there is a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that has been transmitted with two different variations in its wording. One of them says, complete your prayer. And the other one, uh, that after you finish praying with the imam, that you complete your prayer. The other variation of this hadith says that once you finish praying with the imam, that you will make up what you missed from your prayer. So the first one treats that first rakah that you pray with the imam, uh, excuse me, that first one would treat the imam's fourth rakah as your first rakah. And the other one is going to treat the imam's fourth rakah as your fourth rakah. It's kind of weird, huh? But anyways, it has some um, practical implications. Because if you take the one that says, and complete your prayer, then what it means is that your first rakah with the imam is your first rakah, regardless of what rakah the imam is praying. So if you come in during the imam's last rakah, it's still your first rakah. And if you take the other variation, then your first rakah with the imam is actually your fourth rakah because it's his fourth rakah. So anyways, the Shafi'is go with the hadith that you complete your prayer, meaning that when you enter prayer with the imam, regardless of what rakah number he's in, it's your first. So if that's the case, do you recite additional Quran? If you join in in the third and fourth rakah. You're not going to have much time, are you? you you're going to be able to recite al-Fatiha and probably nothing else. So what would you do then when you're finally praying on your own and you, you have more flexibility over your time? Would you go ahead and would you recite additional rakat or not? That's what he's going to have to address here. So Imam Shafi, uh, Imam Nawawi, rahimahullah, next deals with the issue of a latecomer. And he says, 
As Shafi'i, may Allah grant him mercy, said that if someone joined an obligatory prayer after it had already commenced, what was present with the Imam for the last two rakahs of, say, the afternoon prayer, and he then stands to finish the remaining rakahat that he owes, is it recommended that he recite a chapter after Surah Al-Fatiha? The majority of our Shafi'i companions said that this matter involves two opinions. Some say that it is based on a Shafi statement that one should recite the Qur'an in addition to Al-Fatiha and the last two rakahs. And the other opinion is that it is not recommended. And the correct opinion is the former, which is that, let's see, is that it should be done. And why? So that the one's prayer not be void of the additional recitation. Okay. And then he says, and Allah knows best. So this ruling of reciting surahs in the last two rakahs applies to both someone leading the prayer and someone praying alone. Okay. So next he's going to talk about the follower in a prayer. And he says, as for someone being led in prayer, and the prayer is silent, al-fatiha is obligatory, and the additional chapter is recommended. Remember in the Shafi Madhab, we consider it obligatory for everyone to recite Al-Fatiha and every single rakah. This applies to people who are leading the prayer, people who are following someone in prayer, and people who are praying alone. Now, Imam Anawi is going to get into the issue of what if someone who can't memorize Al-Fatiha or hasn't memorized Al-Fatiha? What about someone who, um, for example, is mute? What are we going to do then? He's going to get into that issue later on, but the general rule that he's working with here is that whenever you pray, you have to recite Al-Fatiha. Okay, so that's why he says, as for someone being led in prayer and the prayer is silent, Al-Fatiha is obligatory and the additional chapter is recommended. If the prayer is audible and he can hear the Imam's recitation, it is offensive for him to recite any additional chapter. Now, part of the reason for this is that when the Qur'an is being read, we are commanded to be silent and listen attentively. And that would conflict with you reciting while the Imam is reading. So anyways, he says, there are two opinions regarding Al-Fatiha being obligatory to recite. And the sounder opinion is it is obligatory. The other is that it is not. If one does not hear the Imam's recitation, the sound opinion is that Al-Fatiha is obligatory and the additional chapter is recommended. Other opinions hold that al-Fatiha is not obligatory. Okay, other opinions hold that al-Fatiha is not obligatory. Um, some of the madhahib, including the Hanbali and the Maliki madhahib, consider the Imam's recitation of al-Fatiha to count towards your recitation of al-Fatiha. And from what I remember, the Hanafis are similar to this also. Okay, so the Shafi'is are the ones who are incredibly strict on this issue. Um, so he says, other opinions hold that al-Fatiha is not obligatory. Okay, so that tends to be the non-Shafi'is. And others yet say that it is obligatory and the additional chapter is not recommended and Allah knows best. So as a quick recap, when praying behind an imam, always recite al-Fatiha. And if you can hear the imam recite after al-Fatiha, um, you would recite, excuse me, if you're praying behind an imam, after he recites al-Fatiha, you recite al-Fatiha. And he's supposed to give you a spot, a place where you'll be able to recite your Fatiha. Okay, so in silent prayers, you can't hear the imam, so you would start reciting al-Fatiha immediately. Anyways, we've already covered all of that. So he so far has been talking about the regular format of prayers. So what about some of the other um, interesting prayers we have, like the funeral prayers and, and other prayers that have a slightly different format? So he's going to cover one of those. And he says, it is obligatory to recite al-Fatiha after the first saying of Allahu Akbar, during the funeral prayer. Now the funeral prayer, if you remember from reading fiqh, is a little bit different. In the funeral prayer, there's no rukuwa, 
there's no sujud. So it's a little bit different. And he affirms here that you recite al-Fatiha after the initial saying of Allahu Akbar. And this is said without anything between al-Fatiha and the opening Allahu Akbar. Okay, so as for reciting al-Fatiha in supererogatory prayers, these are prayers that are not required. So these are the nawafil and the rawatib prayers. Okay, it is considered indispensable. So basically, you're not going to pray a single prayer without al-Fatiha being required to recite in it. It's required in every rakah with the exception of the funeral prayer, where it's required only after that first takbir. Okay, so that covers most of the rulings related to the obligation of reciting al-Fatiha. But Imam Anawi has a few things related to al-Fatiha that still needs to be done. And he says, Our Shafi companions disagree over saying Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and al-Fatiha. So, does it have to be said? Is it, is it part of al-Fatiha? Or is it omitted? Or is it recited silently? Okay, these are all options here. And the reason for this is there's a bit of disagreement over whether the basmala, whether Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, is actually a part of al-Fatiha. Um, so there's agreement that is written there. But there's disagreement about whether or not it's actually part of al-Fatiha, meaning that it has to be read. So he says, our Shafi companions disagree over saying, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim in al-Fatiha. Al-Qaffal, who is one of the very early students of the Shafi Madhab, he's not a direct student of Imam Shafi, but he's one of the students of that generation. He says, Al-Qaffal said that there is uh, that it is obligatory, it's a wajib, and his companion Al-Qadi Hussein said that saying the basmala is a conditional short part of the prayer, and others have said that it is an integral rukan part of the prayer, and this is the most preponderant opinion. Okay, so notice we've got the words wajib and short and rukan, and they have different technical meanings. They all have the shared meaning that something has to be done. Where they differ is whether it's something that has to be done continuously throughout the action, which is a shart, whether it's something that is absolutely essential and prayer would then be invalid without, which is a rukan, or whether it's an act that has to be done, but there still might be the possibility that the prayer would be valid without it, which is something that's wajib. Okay, so Imam Shafi, going back, he says, Our Shafi companions disagreed over saying, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim and Al Fatiha. Al Qafal said that it is obligatory, wajib. His companion, Al Qadi Hussein, said that saying the Basmala is a conditional, short part of the prayer. And others have said that it is an integral, rukan part of the prayer, and this is the most preponderant opinion. And it makes sense that it would be the most preponderant opinion, okay? Because a shart is like wudu. It's something that has to be there before the prayer and has to remain throughout it. That doesn't really make a lot of sense for it to be part of the prayer. How could you be reciting the basmala during the entire prayer? And how could you be reciting al-basmala just during al-fatiha? So it makes sense that shart isn't technically the most accurate term. If we we're going to say it's a wajib, it's something that has to be done, but it's not part of it. Okay? But if we say it's a rukan, then it means it's an essential part of it. And that's what the preponderant opinion is. And it makes sense. And that's what we settled on. And that's why the Shafis would say, if you did not recite the basmala, your prayer isn't going to be valid. Okay? So that's our position in the Shafi Madhab. Some other schools, and this includes... The other three Sunni schools do not consider the basmala to be something that has to be done.
But we Shafi's, when we pray behind anyone, we have to be very, very strict about this. Now, alhamdulillah, many other non-Shafi's are aware of this issue. And they will often recite the Basmalah either out loud or they'll recite it silently. But just enough that they can hear it. And alhamdulillah, if they do this, and we're pretty confident that they've recited the Al-Fatiha, even if it wasn't allowed and broadcast to the rest of the, uh, the congregation, it's going to be valid. And by the way, it's the position of the Hanbali Madhab that the Basmala should be recited um, silently, but it doesn't have to be, but it should be recited silently, and then Al-Fatiha is read. Okay, so this is one of the other Madhab out there. It should be done there but it should be silently. So anyways, the Shafi Madhab, and we're going to stick to this because that's the book we're reading, says that Al-Fatiha, uh, Basmala has to be read with Al-Fatiha in order for Al-Fatiha to have been read. And since Al-Fatiha is an essential part of every rakah of the prayer, you got to read the Basmala. You always got to read the Basmala when you do Al-Fatiha. And unfortunately, if you're praying behind an imam and you know they're not reading the basmala, you're going to have to repeat your prayer. But if you do that, please find a way to do it that's not going to disturb other people in the congregation because we don't want to cause a fitna on this one. Okay. Someone incapable of reciting Al-Fatiha in all of those contexts may recite something else in its place. So someone incapable of reciting Al-Fatiha. Incapable either because they are physically unable, so that maybe they're mute, maybe their jaw is broken, may Allah protect us. Um, whatever that reason is, if they're physically unable to do it, there's an issue. What if someone just entered Islam and they haven't yet been able to memorize Al-Fatiha? Okay, this could also apply to them. Um, what do they do? They've got to do something, right? So someone incapable of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha and all of these contexts may recite something else in its place. He may recite something else in the Qur'an of the same length. Um, now something to remember is that it doesn't have to be recited from the person's memory. Someone can coach him in what to say. And it could even be something that's written on the wall so that they can follow that. So as like an initial fallback, if you haven't memorized Al-Fatiha and someone can tell you what to say, even though it's outside of prayer, you can you can repeat what they tell you. Or if it's something that's written in place in a place that's respectful, then you can follow that. Although there's a little bit of disagreement over whether or not your prayer is valid if you are depending on something that's written. But you know what? If we're talking about someone who can't recite Al-Fatiha, we're, we're already digging into necessity. So inshallah, it's acceptable and forgiven here. So someone who is incapable of reciting Al-Fatiha, either because they have not been able to, to learn it and they have a valid excuse for not learning it, like being a brand new Muslim or having memory issues, or someone who's physically not able to do it. What they will do is they're going to recite something else in the Qur'an that's of the same length. And by same length here, we're talking about it has the same number of letters in it. If he is incapable of that, so if he doesn't have something from the Qur'an that he can use in the instead of Al-Fatiha, then he may repeat invocations of the same length, like saying SubhanAllah or La ilaha illallah. And they should be different. He shouldn't be repeating the same one over and over again unless he doesn't know enough. If he is incapable of anything at all, okay, so someone who, for example, they don't have a tongue, they're, or they're, they're, they're mute, or they have a paralyzed tongue. If he's incapable of anything at all, and may Allah protect us, he stands for the length of time it takes to recite Al-Fatiha, and then he bows and Allah knows best. And by the way, what's another reason? If they recite Al-Fatiha, they're going to get beaten up. And Say we've got a new Muslim, and if the people he lives with find out that he has entered Islam, they're going to kill him, or they're going to beat him up, or they're going to torture him. And I know that for people living in the West, this sounds like pretty far-fetched, but Muslims who convert 
to Islam in some old countries, um, they really are putting their life at risk if the rest of the community around them were to find out. And it's quite a difficult question to get sometimes because even though necessity will render the otherwise unlawful lawful to the extent needed, it's still not something that you want to have to deal with. Um, so anyways, uh, the general rule is you have to reset al-Fatiha in every single rakah if you're capable of doing so. If you're not capable of doing so, you bring something else in the Qur'an that's of equal length. If you can't do that, then you bring other of Kar and Arabic of the same length. And if that isn't even an option, then you're going to stand at least long enough that you could have recited al-Fatiha. So you, you stand there long enough for it to have happened. And inshallah, it's enough. And the same ruling is going to come up when it comes to other obligatory of car within the prayer. So it's going to come up also when we talk about the, um, the, the final tashahud. He's also going to come up with something similar. Okay, so that little uh, guideline that we just covered here is something that's going to repeat a few times. And it's something that if you're in an area where lots of people enter Islam, or if you're engaging in da'wah and new Muslims, this is one of those rulings you really need to have. Um, you need to have down. Because prayer for new Muslims and prayer for newly observant old Muslims can be a little bit difficult in the beginning. And you want to do what you can to ensure that they're praying and to facilitate that they pray. Because even if they're praying a prayer that is not perfect, and it's not complete, and it might not even be legally valid, except for due to their circumstances, it's still better for them to do that because someone who prays according to the best of their abilities and in the best way possible given their circumstances, that prayer is going to have an effect on them. Okay, so we need to do everything we can to facilitate that people maintain prayer. And this is why you're going to find that some contemporary muftis um, end up having a bit of leniency when it comes to people praying during their time. So, for example, in I think the 20s or the 30s, actually it would have been probably a little bit after that. I'm not quite sure the exact decade, but in Damascus, because of colonialism, kids were finding it difficult to pray in schools. Most of the schools were being run by the Europeans who had taken over uh, Damascus as part of their colon colonial efforts, okay? So they ran the schools and they made it difficult for people to pray. There was really no way that people could wash their feet. So one of the solutions to this was to pull out some weak opinions within the Hanbali Madhab that would make it easier for people to wipe over whatever they had on their foot as though it could take the place of khuf. And so, for example, Jamal al-Din al-Qasimi, rahimahullah, in his essay about wiping over socks, he explains in there that one of the reasons for him doing this was to ensure that the school kids of his age would be able to continue to maintain prayer, even though the facilities that they had to go to school in did everything they could to prevent them from making prayer. Okay, so this was one of the reasons why the weak, um, overruled opinion from the Hanbali Madhab was adopted by some people. Well, if we're in an age where it's quite easy to do that and you don't have to worry about persecution, there's no reason to be digging into weak opinions. Okay, so anyways, when it comes to Al-Fatiha, if we have reasons for people not to recite it, if they have legitimate shara'i, legal reasons for them not to recite it, then we have to have some alternative for them. And the absolute fallback position is that they at least stand long enough that someone could have recited it. Okay, and Imam Nawawi, with his humility, then ends this section with Allah knows best. And this is all I'm going to read today. Um, and inshallah, we'll continue either to tomorrow or the day after. 
And until then, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.